Hi, Dominique, food lady. And today I am thrilled to share with you one of the best things that I have found in food in about 10 years, einkorn wheat. Why is it so intense? Well, because 10 years ago, I was found to be allergic to gluten. I'm lucky I'm not hugely allergic. I don't have celiac disease, but basically when I eat gluten, I stop digesting well, I get blocked up, it's painful, I get puffy, but most importantly, in that puffiness, I stop digesting nutrients out of food and I progressively get less and less healthy. So, what does that mean for an Italian being allergic to gluten? I gave up wheat pasta. Most importantly, I gave up bread. I mean, yes, I can still eat gluten-free bread, but <laughs> I gave up bread. Well, einkorn wheat, it turns out I can eat. Why? Because einkorn is the most ancient grain that we know of as humans. It's basically a wild grain and it has not been married together with other grains to increase and strengthen the gluten. Well, it turns out that what we also did is we hybridized regular wheat with these things called goat grasses that have a really strong gluten. So in much of our modern wheat, that's what you find. Now that people are being tested on things like einkorn wheat, it turns out that some of us who are allergic to the modern gluten are not allergic to the ancient way that we used to eat wheat. Yay! Okay, so today I'm gonna make this great boule inside of a Dutch oven. So I've got all of my tools here, the Dutch oven, a little banneton basket, because when you're working with einkorn wheat, it needs to be a much wetter dough. And so you need to have it rise in something. Then we've got a little bread lame so that you can make little designs on your bread. As you can see here, I have the wheat kernels and the einkorn all-purpose flour. I'm doing it half from fresh milled and half from all-purpose because the closest you get, again, it's, it's my food philosophy, the closest that you get to nature, right? We have a mill at home. We're also gonna sift the flour and I'll explain why. And here's my sourdough mother. So that's the other thing that makes it really possible for me to eat wheat bread again, sourdough. A really good mother of these bacterias and, ye and natural yeasts is it creates a bread that is kind of, well, it's kind of pre-fermented. And so it's so much easier for you to digest it. It's like the difference between drinking milk and eating yogurt. So let's just start. And here's the Levain that I prepared for the bread last night. milled the flour because it's a very loud procedure. What I do now, that's also another little trick once you, if you mill flour yourself. I take it and I sift it. So here you go. This is the fresh milled flour. The reason why I sift it is that the husk of any berry, even if you mill it very, very small, that husk creates little pointy particles. The more pointy particles you have, the less rise you're going to have in your bread. Because basically what happens is that those pointy particles, as the yeast is fermenting in there and creating the air pockets, it starts popping the pockets. What you want to do is get the bigger particles out and then you still have a lot of the good nutrition from the husk in there because you have smaller particles of that but you're gonna get out some of the really pointy and bigger bits and you're gonna have an airier bread. And this is what I get out. I'm going to sift all this flour and then get back to you. Okay, so we've got our um, fresh milled flour sifted and we can move on to the process. Uh, another thing with einkorn wheat is because the gluten that it has is not very 
powerful, not very strong, you're actually not going to work it. So it's not one of those breads that you can get your, you know, anxiety out on. No, you're actually going to want to work it very little and you're going to work uh, with your hands only a little bit because it's a very wet dough and I'll show you how to do that. Let's prepare the liquid. We want uh, 335 grams of liquid. What I've done is I've already set up 235 grams of coconut milk. You can use half and a half, uh, but in terms of plant-based, use coconut milk because you want the fat. It, it's that fat that is going to kind of chill out the sour of the sourdough. You want the liquid warm, so I put in hot water. But before we do that, I also add some sweetness to the bread because that also is a juxtaposition to the sourness of the sourdough and that's where we get the um to me the better taste so i put in one tablespoon and a half of honey and do you know this hack of how to get things like honey or molasses or stuff like that out of your measuring spoon is you put oil in it so since I'm using coconut milk, I'm using coconut oil spray and I'm going to measure it here. One, that's just the foam from the coconut oil spray. So see how it comes out completely when you do that? And one and a half. All right. So now what I do is I use the hot water. Okay, so this way the honey will just go through everything and not stay in lumps and then have a part of the bread sweeter than others. Okay, so I only need 100 more grams and I'm going to do it with hot liquid so that I warm up the entire liquid. Basically, you're going to want a liquid that's somewhere between 90 to maximum 100 degrees, but closer to the 90 degrees. Okay, and this is, there you go. We have our 100 grams. Okay, so we've got our liquid. Put the Levain in there. Making sourdough bread doesn't take a lot of your work especially when it's einkorn and you're not kneading and really putting a lot of muscle into it, but it takes a lot of time. You have to let it proof for between the two proofs about four hours, between three and a half and four hours. So it takes time. So you put the Levain, you put in your liquid. There we go. You mix in your Levain so that you have a liquefied start. So here you go. And then now we finally put in the flour. Now, in terms of flour, we want 600 grams. So what I do is I do half of the sifted milled einkorn. and a half of all-purpose. If you want to use um, all all-purpose flour, then bring the liquid down to 310 grams. Bring it down because when you don't have as many uh, whole solids of the husk, then um, you just need less liquid. Then, you want to add a teaspoon and a half of salt. Okay, the process of bringing this dough together, you can also use a dough hook if you have one of those. I don't, when you don't have it, and I've been making this bread for months, just a spatula will do. And when all of the flour is incorporated, and as you can see, it's a very wet dough, then you are done. 
And what you're gonna do is you're gonna cover this and let it rest for 15 minutes to let it soak up the water. And then we're going to do a process of folding in so that you are kind of waking up the gluten in einkorn, but you're not, it's very easy to overwork, so you don't wanna do that. So we're gonna do the process in 15 minutes. See you then. Okay, so we're just about at 15. Oh, three, two, one. Okay, so here you have a very sticky, wet dough, but wonderful dough. And so here's two other implements. You can just have a bowl scraper because it usually has the straight side that you can scrape your counter with, but I like the metal scraper to scrape your counter with, just it's easier. So if you can have both, great. If not, bowl scraper will do for both. Okay, so how are we gonna deal with this very wet dough? Well, we're gonna do this. We are going to flour, and you can do a good flouring because I also add extra moisture. Flour, your bowl scraper. Then you flour your hands really, really well. And you don't wanna flour the top of the dough because you don't really wanna get this dough drier. You just wanna do things <laughs> enough so that you can work with it. You wanna pull it out into kind of a rectangle and you're gonna take the top of the rectangle, fold it in, then go to the side, fold it in, this side, fold it in, and that side, fold it in. And then just work it into a bowl, a ball, excuse me, and put it back in your bowl. That's it. And you cover it up and you wait another 15 minutes so that it keeps just soaking up the liquid and then you do it again. So you do this two more times and I'll see you on the last time and we'll start the proof. See you soon. And now I'm gonna do a third fold, put it in a clean bowl and put it off to proof. Flour your hands. Flour the bowl scraper and get your dough out of the bowl. While I was waiting in between, I actually had, I'll cut in a picture, I had three pieces of bread from a loaf that I made last week. And so today's a Saturday, I made it last Sunday and I just keep it in the fridge and it stays well. So I just cut three pieces and I had almond butter and bell pepper jam, open faced little sandwiches. Super yummy. Yay, great lunch. Okay, so as you can see, it's still wet, it's less tacky and it's starting to get stretchier. So the gluten has woken up. It's working in there. So you do the same thing, fold it in, fold there, fold here, fold here, and then fold it over and kind of create a little bit of a bowl. And you can feel it, it's gotten bouncy and smooth. So you take this, you put it in your bowl and you either put it into a proofing oven, which I have, at the lowest possible temperature. So my proofing oven, the lowest temperature that it has is 80 degrees. I put it in for two hours, I check it, and then I put any extra time. And what you're gonna wanna see is you're gonna wanna see about a 30% rise with some bubbles showing. And I'll show you once we've got it proofed 
what that's going to look like. Usually with bread, you're looking for two and a half, three times the rise. No, no, don't expect that from einkorn. What I also do, I take the kitchen towel that I've been using, cover it, and I wet it. I get it all wet and I cover um, this. It just adds more moisture. And the more moisture, the more moisture you're going to have in your bread. Great. See you soon. Okay, so we're back after, oh, two and a half hours of proofing, and here we go. So, what's interesting is at the beginning, for the first hour, hour and a half, nothing seems to be happening, and then it just starts rising. And you see how there's little air bubbles? That's what you want to see, and you want to see about a 30% rise. And when this starts happening, you're like, yay, and you think, okay, I'll let it go more and more. No. Um, with proofing of bread, too little, and you're not going to get the rise because basically all of the uh, yeasts and bacteria aren't mature enough. But too much, that means you get too much of the process before you put it in the oven. And then once you're in the oven, it doesn't get a chance to rise. Oh, and I realized that I don't even have my apron on. So hold on one moment. It takes so much time that you're doing all sorts of other things in between. And I need my apron because I'm about to play with flour again. Okay, so let's see. I need this yummy tool. I've got my flour. And this time for the proofing, we need a vessel for it to proof. So again, because einkorn um, needs a wetter dough, what happens is that you can't create a shape with it and then just put it to proof and think that that shape is going to hold. It's just going to move and you're going to have a rised pancake, basically. So you want to proof it in a container. And then what you're going to be doing is you're going to be dumping it out of this container directly into a hot Dutch oven. So that, that, that heat kind of creates a, a skin around it and then it's going to hold its shape and it's going to be able to rise from there. Okay, so the thing that we need to do is very well flour the banneton basket. So you don't have to do it in this banneton basket. Um, you can just use a regular bowl and what you want to do is you either put a lot of flour or you line it with linen and you flour the linen and then it won't stick. Um, when you do that, you get a nice kind of texture to the bread, but I like this because it makes these nice rings. You'll see. Notice that I keep the flour that I scrape off the counter because I can use that flour just to flour here. I'm always about using everything multiple times if you can. See how there's beautiful air in there and see how it's nice and stretchy? That's the gluten in here working well. For so long when I would hear that word, I would like, Ooh. but now it's okay. Go ahead, work gluten. You don't want to completely flatten it, but you do want to take a little bit of the air out. You're going to allow for more air to um, get created in there. And so you're kind of uh, keeping some of the bubbles in there, more will be created. And so it's kind of a build up. What you want to do is Take the edges and you bring them into a ball. Anything that sticks, just pick it up. Wow, very, very moist, this loaf. And so once you kind of have it in somewhat of a circle, all right, then you take it and you turn it around, cup it, you want to make sure 
that your hands are not sticking to it. And then what you do is you come in cup and swirl, cup and swirl, cup and swirl. And what you're doing is you're just feeling for it to be catching on the counter. Because the minute that it's catching on the counter, then what you realize is happening is that the pieces that you've tucked under are kind of coming together and it's ready to flip it over. So I am starting to feel it catching and what I do is I pick it up and dump it down. So you see how it all caught nicely. This last little bit, I'm just gonna bring in a bit. I think it's gonna be fine. Because remember that this is going to be the underneath because I'm going to dump it down into the Dutch oven. I proof it until it fills up, the sides of it fill up to here. And it just allows it to sit and to start reworking some of that air. Okay, so let's get this into the proofing oven. Right now, you're going to preheat your oven to 500 degrees, very, very hot. A lot of recipes tell you to, at this point, already put your Dutch oven into the oven so that it preheats with it. I have found this, and if I put the Dutch oven now, I always get, excuse me, an overcooked bottom, which I don't like. I actually put the Dutch oven in 20 minutes before I'm gonna put my bread into it. The bottom doesn't cook as quickly and I like it better. So that's what we're gonna do. I am going to put a timer for 40 minutes because I've got that on for an hour. I'll know when to put the Dutch oven in. The proofing bell rang. The second proof of the bread has been about an hour and I already have the Dutch oven warming up in the oven. So let's go take a look at the bread and see if it's ready. So yes, it's a beautiful proof. So see how it's coming up kind of over the basket. Time to get this cooking. All right, so we're gonna take Okay, close the oven back up when you do this because you want to keep that heat in there. All right, so this is nicely warmed up. Whew. Okay, so this is the, the part that always gets me kind of nervous because I want to tip it in there without burning myself. Hopefully it'll come out and if it doesn't come out in the center, we'll fix it. Okay, so come. Yes, all right. So you see how it did not fall into the center. That's okay. Just leave it for about 10 seconds and then you can move it. Yeah, okay. So now that means that the circular stuff is not quite centered. That's all right. The other thing that you wanna do is you wanna score it. You can do it with a really sharp knife, but these bread lanes, that's what they're called, which have an ultra sharp blade at the end, plus they're put in such a way so that the blade can only go that deep are just more professional. So what I usually do is I go, excuse me, I go from the center and I make a curve like this and another curve like this. And at least you can feel the heat off of it and you don't forget to put on your gloves. Another curve like this and a final curve. All right, so now it is ready to go into the oven and cook. Here we go. It's anywhere between uh, 25 and 35 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes, depending on how dark you like it. I like it on the lighter side, so I am gonna put 28 minutes. Why do you score it the way that I did? Um, yes, one thing is it makes it pretty, but that's not the only thing. Your bread has created a skin on top of it. Now, as it's going in there, 
the fermentation is going to continue, so that yeast is going to be continuing to create air. That skin that was already created during the proof and then now is getting stronger as it heats up might keep it from rising the way that you want it. You want to give it room to extend. We've got it cooking and once it's done, we'll look at this bread. Timer just went off and it's time to get the bread out. Always remember, protect against the heat because it's very, very hot. Yay. Here we go. And here's our bread. Yay. See how the bottom gets darker and the least dark it is, the better it is. Here's our bread. So I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Ratatouille. In it, at one point, this uh, seasoned chef is trying to teach this young chef. And when she tells him about bread, she says, it's not the look, it's not the smell, it is the sound. Hear that crackle? It is the sound. So here we go. Now normally I would let this cool but I want to show you how it is on the inside. So I'm going to cut it right down the middle. Okay. And there you go. So you'll notice that einkorn wheat is denser than other bread, but you still are getting the air bubbles. You're still getting a nice rise and it's beautifully moist and you know it's done correctly when you push it in and it doesn't stay, it comes back, it's elastic. And the smell is unbelievable. Einkorn is very nutty and rich in flavor. So here you go, this is your sourdough einkorn boule and I'll be posting lots of pictures of how I eat it, how the things that I make with it, how I enjoy it and please, Make it, let me know how it turns out. Leave me comments, subscribe, hit the notification button. Thank you so much.